Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Dale Climola, uh, retired somewhat, and live in Jackson, Michigan. Uh, my wife is the one with the, the big hat. <laughs> Her name is Gail. Anyway, it's good to be here with you and uh, good to see you. Uh, welcome to all who are visitors this morning. Uh, pray God's uh, blessing upon you. We begin now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our worthiness to confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We confess, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only son to die for you and to bring you the forgiveness of all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will sing to the Lord. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing to the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, the 40th chapter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely are they sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them, and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him? Says the Holy One, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My right is disregarded by God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men fall exhausted. But they who wait in the Lord shall be renewed, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the ninth chapter. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, that in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. <clears throat> to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all men, by all means, I may save some. I do it for all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. Do you not know that in a race, all the racers run, but only one receives the prize? Every athlete exercises self-control and, oh, I'm sorry, so run that you may obtain, the, obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel from St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately, immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place. There he prayed, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's good to be with you and to celebrate the sacrament and to hear God's word. The text for today is a couple of portions from the Old Testament lesson, beginning with the, the first verse rather than the 
the verse of the gospel, or the lesson had us begin at. And it reads, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Have you not heard? Have you not known? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has, has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a wee lad, I enjoyed watching an old um, game show called Password. Each match always started out with the same thing, with a, a voice from the shadows. The phrase of the word, the word is, and then the word would come. This morning, the word is comfort. Comfort is a word that makes me think of tenderness, of kindness, of compassion, perhaps even warmth. It's like having a nice snuggly blanket wrapped around you, uh, keeping you safe and secure and, and comfortable. As we will see this morning, Jesus is the very incarnation of the comfort that Isaiah speaks of. He is the word of God shining in a weary, sin-darkened world, bringing the light of the gospel of peace. In Isaiah's time, much was, comfort was much in demand. The historic context of the text begins actually with the previous chapter, chapter 20, 39. The context is a warning that God gave Judah because of their idolatry and rejection of God's promises. Judah was one of two of God's favorite possessions, the other being Israel. It was his desire that the kingdom of Judah would hear, heed his voice and follow him just as lambs follow their shepherd. But that was not to be. Ignoring his directive to drive out the the people that lived in the land when they entered the promised land, the kingdom of Israel, the original kingdom, the undivided kingdom, worked to appease them. And as a result, the Israelites began to accept the customs of the natives. They did not heed the warning offered by, by Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for he shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law of Moses that my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success." Well, of course, we know that Israel fell into temptation and began to worship the idols of the people they were supposed to drive out of the land. And so as a result of their rebellious behavior, God gave a warning that Israel would be judged. In chapter 39, we hear this warning. Isaiah said to King Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Be the, behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and some of your own sons who will come from you whom you will father shall be taken away, 
and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah is described as one of the good kings of Judah. He tried to enact reforms of pulling down the high places, of destroying the idols, and encourage faithfulness from his kingdom. Yet in spite of his noble character, he had kind of a strange way of thinking at the morning that Isaiah came. And that is, he said, this is a good thing, because he thought that it would lead to peace. Imagine that. But Isaiah did not see peace. Just as the Lord warned, Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. The result was just as the prophet warned, Judah was attacked, annihilated by Babylon. The result was anything but pleasant. This is what we see in 2 Kings 25. They slaughtered the sons of Hezekiah, and before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. In addition, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses in Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem, and the rest of the people were left in the city. And the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuchadnezzarian, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. And so the great kingdom of Judah, the sacred city of Jerusalem, were both destroyed. That's not the end of the story. There's good news. Isaiah promised to redeem Judah from their bondage. And when the Lord God showed mercy on his people with Judah's return, Isaiah promised to comfort his people. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. That's good news indeed. Peace is restored. It's interesting that Hezekiah thought that with the warning that Isaiah gave, peace would follow. Well, after much suffering and much time, peace did come. But not as Hezekiah thought. No peace came by the hand, peace came by the hand of the Lord God that Judah had rebelled against. Now it's time to turn attention to ourselves. Today's sermon is all about comfort. God's comfort to the world as the world's sin bearer. But before we hear words of comfort, words of gospel, we must hear the word of judgment from the law. We live in a time in which idolatry is rampant. We focus in particular on idolatry, judgment, and comfort. All humans lust, lust after false gods, be it worship of the narcissistic self, a desire for fame, fortune, wealth, a desire for God's gifts that we treat without regard for the, un, for the unintended consequences, addictions, abuse, and enslavement. It is the idolatry to its core. In short, we do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things. A quick test for idolatry is to think honestly about what you're unwilling to give up. 
That, my friends, is your idol. With idolatry, judgment always follows, whether it's an addiction, theft, covetousness, a host of other idols we worship, we are judged by our actions and response to those things we crave. David Zoll in his book, Seculosity, wrote, the new idols and religions today that hold sway over people are careers, technologies, food, parenting, politics, romance. Eventually, as the word of God warns, your sin will find you out. Consequences to our idolatry are such things as the loss of one's reputation, the loss of respect from those who once held you in high esteem, and other social and personal damage. Serious idolatry runs the risk of divorce, estrangement from family and friends, loss of employment, or loss of possessions. Whatever the consequence, the result is always the same. Shame, self-reproach, pain and suffering. It might even seem as though God and his comfort have been driven away. Helplessness and hopeless, we fall into despair. A man named Reverend Dr. Ro Rod Rosenblatt reminds us that the most important thing to remember is that the death of Christ was in fact for Christian failure. Christ's death saves even Christians from death. There's always room at the cross for unbelievers, and there is also room at the cross for Christians too. That's a message that we need to share with each other, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. They're removed from us as far as the east is from the west whichever direction east and west are. But they're driven, they're removed. And the same should be true for us, to forgive one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Our gracious God brings even to us his comforting promise of the forgiveness of sins. When the Lord seems to be distant, when we fear that our sin has created a huge chasm that cannot be surmounted, when we fall into hopelessness and hopelessness, be assured your God is with you. St. Paul wrote, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that the focus is on Jesus. We're given strength by the promised Yes, in Jesus. He alone is the source of comfort when sin afflicts and assails us. A verse from the liturgy for the burial of the dead reminds us of the comfort we receive from God himself. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all mercies, the God of all mercy, all comforts, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may comfort others with the comfort we ourselves are comforted with by God. And so just what is the comfort we need? Isn't it the simple yet not so simple gospel? The greatest comfort we have is that that which is found in Jesus and what he did for our idolatrous and sinful behavior. The author of Hebrews wrote, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. The one who shed his blood for us is, of course, none other than our savior from sin, from death and the devil. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed and comforted. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in that faith to life everlasting. Amen.